to be here and I know that you all have been involved in Save the Frogs events, including Save the Frogs Day for about a decade now. So just want to start out with a huge thank you to everybody who has uh, taken part, volunteered in any of those events and helped out with amphibian conservation and education in any way over the years. My presentation is split into two to have. So we're going to start out with an introduction to amphibian conservation. All right, frogs are the most well known of the amphibians. They're one of five, five main groups of amphibians. But they're the ones that they're making a lot of noise. They're the most visible ones and the most common, commonly seen. So it's what people usually think of when they think of amphibians. I spent a lot of time in California. I'm not there now, but I used to live there. Save the Frogs was based there. This is the most common frog people see in California and perhaps one of the most famous frogs in the world because when they're filming movies in Hollywood and you hear frogs in the background, it's usually this frog calling. So this gives a standard kind of ribbit. And so ribbit has become a famous frog call all around the world, even though all frogs make their own unique call that's actually one way to identify species is by the call perhaps the most famous toad in the world the cane toad they're famous because they've been transported around the world they've become a bad invasive species actually in certain places such as in australia where they're not native but now there's hundreds of millions of them so toads are actually a type of frog so really frogs and toads go together they're called the anurans and then we have the amphibians with tails. Those are the salamanders and the newts. Salamanders, uh, they have a tail. They can live in all types of places. This one I found high up in the mountains in Washington State in the USA, above snow line. He was underneath a rock. Uh, newts are a type of salamander. So the salamanders and newts go together. And the newts tend to have a lot of poison on their skin. This one, very poisonous. And then the fifth type of amphibian is the Sicilian. The Sicilians tend to live underground. People often mistake them as snakes or worms. And uh, they're limbless amphibians. And they don't call. They're only going to be seen, generally speaking, when there's heavy rain. I've actually never seen one. They're hard to find because they don't congregate around ponds. You don't know where to go to look for them. And they're not all hanging out together in the same place. So you got to be pretty lucky to see one. So those are the five types of amphibians. Now there's a term herpetology, the study of amphibians and or reptiles. This term came because hundreds of years ago, scientists mistakenly believed that reptiles and amphibians were the same. But we know now that they're different. This here is a reptile. It has scales. Amphibians don't have scales. Reptiles, when they have eggs, have hard-shelled eggs. Whereas amphibians, like these frogs, have soft eggs. They don't have that hard protective outside like a reptile. And that's why amphibians like to be in wet places and get active in the rainy season. These eggs are underwater. They're in a river. The amphibian eggs, if they dry up, they're going to die. So that's super important for amphibians. Another big difference between the amphibians and reptiles is metamorphosis. Some frogs and toads will have a tadpole stage. They'll have gills that they're breathing with that eventually turn into lungs. They'll have a tail that eventually goes back into their body. They use that for energy. And then they'll pop out legs and arms crawl out of the water, and there'll be a metamorph for maybe a few weeks. Depends on the species. So they're somewhere between a tadpole and an adult. And eventually, they have, in almost all species, they have external fertilization. Their mating embrace is called amplexus. And the cycle continues. One thing that's very important about amphibians is that their skin is permeable. 
our skin is meant to protect us. It keeps things out. But amphibians, they can take in water and oxygen straight through their skin. There's some amphibians that as adults, they do not have any lungs. They can get all their oxygen directly through their skin. We can tell a lot about amphibians by looking at their feet. So here we see red webs, the red webbed gladiator frog. So if we see webs, chances are that the species spends a lot of time in the water. Frogs, amphibians are gape limited predators. That means they'll eat whatever they can put in their mouth. They're carnivores as adults. So if it's alive and they can put it in their mouth, then they're going to eat it. And it doesn't matter if it's a sack of insect eggs or another frog or a beetle or a slug or a worm or a bird or a fish. If they can catch it and it's alive and they can put it in their mouth, then they'll be fine to eat it. All right, how many amphibian species exist worldwide? As of today, the known number of species, 8,431, of which probably 80 plus percent of those are going to be frogs and toads, and then maybe 15 percent or so salamanders and newts, and then a few percent Sicilians. So frogs and toads, definitely the most biodiverse part of that group. I grew up in Virginia in the eastern USA not too far from Washington, D.C. And when I was young, my parents built this pond on the property. There had been a small stream going through there. So actually at the right side of this photo, um, a dam got built to stop the water. There is an outflow, but this pond is here. Um, in this day and age, when, when Save the Frogs builds wetlands, we don't build dams. So we would not build it like this, but it has been a very successful pond. And there are at least seven amphibian species that hang out in the area. I did not know that when I was young, but I would see frogs occasionally. And when I'd sleep in the summer with my window open on hot nights, I'd hear gray tree frogs calling. Now I cannot make my vocal sac go out like a frog, but frogs have this vocal sac. The males do because it's the males that are calling. It's called their advertisement call. They're advertising that this is their territory and that they're looking for a mate. So every frog, as I said, has a different call. Green frog, we can see it's tympanum, it's eardrum right here. Spring peeper, a very small frog. Small frogs have high pitched calls. Spring peeper, it's called that because they come out early spring, right when the ice is fine, and they make a peeping sound. Beep, beep. I spent four years in Australia. I was doing my PhD research on amphibians there. And I'd go out at night. Most frogs are nocturnal, so they're getting active at night. So I'd go out at about sunset take a volunteer out and we'd be out for three, four hours maybe looking for frogs. And this is one of my favorite places, Purling Brook Falls. We would go down to the bottom of the falls, hike down to the bottom, look for frogs. And we'd find cascade tree frogs. <laughs> Emerald spotted tree frog. We can see the toe pads here, so that helps to climb trees, tree frog. Now there's also some webbing here, meaning that they're set for, they're suited for the trees and for swimming. Southern orange-eyed tree frog, my favorite frog. This is the frog from the Save the Frogs logo. Scarlet-sided pobble bonk. Now here, there they hang out on the ground, not in the trees and not in the water too much. So they don't have webbing and they don't have toe pads either. They've got a nice smile 
and a cool call. They got their name Bonk, Pobble Bonk. Bonk, Bonk. Eastern Sedgehog. So we know this is a male because he has a vocal sack. Great Bard Frog. He's got a mosquito up there. He's got bars on his legs and no toe pads, no webbing. Big Frog. Big Frogs make deep calls. Or, or, or. Striped Marsh Frog. There's the stripe. They live in the marsh and they're a frog. So they're called the Striped Marsh Frog. Easiest frog call ever. Maybe everyone can do that. Even if the moderator is out there and can unmute everybody for like five seconds, maybe we could hear a, some frog calls around the world. I hear one. I, it's, uh, I hear one. It's over there. <laughs> All right. Thanks, whoever that was. And everybody else, feel free to keep making the frog calls, but... Let's move on. So marsupial frogs, the last frog I'm going to show you for now, I think, is they're called a marsupial frog, like a kangaroo marsupial. They're not marsupials, but they have this pouch right here. Baby frogs can, or they, they don't have a tadpole. They'll lay eggs in the moist leaf litter. Frog lits emerge from there. Very small frog like this. So you can imagine that pouch is small. And they'll have the father will carry like 15 frogs froglets in each of those pouches until they're ready to um, go off on their own. All right, so frogs are really cool, but they're in a lot of trouble worldwide. At least 2,400 amphibian species threatened with extinction, which means that if we don't do anything to protect them or remove those threats, we can expect them to go extinct in the near future. There's also about, I believe, about 1,100 Species considered data deficient. That means we don't know what's happening with them. Usually it's because their population sizes are so small that they're hard to study. Small population size makes them prone to extinction. So the true number of threatened species, probably at least 3,000 species. So about a third of amphibian species threatened with extinction. That makes them the most threatened group of vertebrates. More threatened than fish, mammals, birds, reptiles. And unfortunately, there have already been a couple hundred amphibian extinctions in recent decades. So they're disappearing several thousand times faster than they should be. Habitat destruction is the biggest problem that amphibians face around the world. Habitat destruction is one of six major threats to amphibians. So habitat destruction, that's chopping down trees, deforestation, building, putting buildings up on top of wetlands, um, destroying wetlands, draining wetlands for agricultural purposes, building roads. So we need to protect wilderness. Santa Cruz, California has one of the world's most threatened salamander species. Only 23 populations left. Between their ponds, they have all of this um, altered habitat that they would have to cross through to get to different ponds. They could get taken out by a predator. They could dry up in the sun. They could get run over on the roads. Monocultures are a big problem for amphibians. It's not very good habitat when it's only one, one type of plant growing there, like sugarcane. Um, I visited this national park in Bangladesh. It's a national park, but there's illegal tea plantations inside it. Even though it's theoretically protected, a lot of problems. Palm oil in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Borneo is causing problems because rainforest gets chopped down to grow the palm. Uh, they burn off the rainforest. Mining for gold and all, uh, bauxite and lots of different... Um, Different types of mining, legal and illegal, taking place. Another big threat to amphibians is that they're being taken out of the wild for use as pets. Especially the poison dart frog, brightly colored species from Latin America.
people eating frogs, frog legs, about a billion frogs eaten, wild frogs each year. Um, California red-legged frogs nearly went extinct about 120 years ago in the United States and California uh, when the gold miners were eating the frogs. Invasive species, non-native species that get introduced to places either on purpose or by mistake, such as trout up in high mountain lakes and streams, love to eat frogs and tadpoles. So mountain yellow-legged frogs in California, threatened by non-native trout. They've been, um, they have, they are no longer sighted at about 93% of their historic localities. They cannot coexist with the fish. If you remove the fish though, then the frogs can come back. Red swamp crayfish love to eat amphibians. Some amphibians cause problems for amphibians. The American bullfrog, largest frog in North America, native to the eastern half of the USA and Canada, introduced into the western United States and at least 15 countries around the world, primarily because they're a big frog and they've got a lot of meat on their legs, so they're grown in the frog farms. And they escape their farms and they cause a lot of problems. They've got a big mouth. Frogs eat what they can put in their mouth. They love to eat native frogs and snakes and birds and fish and whatever else they can catch. Pollution and pesticides, all that bad, bad chemicals are getting into the water where the amphibians live and breed. Um, many, many different chemicals. One is atrazine, which can cause, it's an herbicide, second most commonly used herbicide in the world, can turn male frogs into females at less than two parts per billion. It's an endocrine disruptor. Climate change, global warming, um, cloud forests are drying up, rainfall levels change, such as in Yellowstone National Park where there have been persistent droughts. And my scientific specialty, infectious diseases. Here's another type of barred frog, the flays barred frog, endangered due to the chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrum dendrobatitis, which unfortunately has been spreading around the world in recent decades impacting especially the montane amphibians, the amphibians that live up in the mountains. Cooler areas, cool wet areas, chytrid fungus causes lots of problems and has driven about 100 amphibian species to complete extinction. It is the worst disease known to humans, okay? Doesn't impact humans directly, but as far as biodiversity, there's no other disease we know of that has caused such um, problems driving so many species to complete extinction. All right, frogs are important. They're eating ticks, mosquitoes, flies that spread diseases. They eat pests of agricultural crops. They keep our food supply safe. Um, they're an integral part of the food web. They're food for birds, fish, snakes, dragonflies, monkeys. Lots of animals eat and depend on frogs. Uh, we get a lot of medical benefit from having amphibians in existence, about 10% of the Nobel Prizes in Physiology and Medicine went to researchers whose work depended on amphibians. They're bioindicators. They're telling us about the health of the ecosystem. They've got permeable skin. They cannot easily move to a new area. They can't fly away like a bird could if something happens to their pond. And they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. A lot longer than we have. They've survived countless ice ages, asteroid crashes, outlived the dinosaurs, and yet in the last half century or so we've managed to drive about a third of them to the edge of extinction. So it's saying that something needs to get fixed. And we have a moral and ethical duty to do so. They've been around longer than we have. They have every bit as much right to exist as we do. And frogs are cool. People like frogs. Kids like frogs. That's good enough reason to work to save them. The world is a better place to live with frogs around. And it's up to you to save the frogs. It's up to me too. It's my job. But it's definitely up to all of us. And we're going to be a lot more successful if everybody is taking part in saving the frogs. And fortunately, 
there's lots of ways that we can all help just by improving our ecological footprint, our day-to-day -day actions. Don't use pesticides. Whenever possible, eat locally grown organic food. It didn't get shipped around the world using up fuel, contributing to climate change. It hasn't been sprayed with pesticides. Don't eat frog legs. Slow down driving on wet nights. Watch where you're driving. Try not to hit the frogs. Do not purchase wild caught amphibians. Don't stock non-native fish in your pond or stream. Reduce your water usage. If you're in a dry part of the world, maybe there's a lot of rain where you are, you're in the tropics, but in desert areas like California, the water is coming out of the rivers and it'll dry up the rivers and the tributaries and the frogs habitat. Don't purchase bottled water unless there's no other choices. That plastic bottle um, took a lot of energy to create and there's a lot of chemicals and it doesn't break down easily. Use rechargeable batteries whenever possible. Batteries are packed full of chemicals, so the less we use, the better. And how we vote is incredibly important. Vote for environmentally frog-friendly politicians whenever possible. What we eat has a huge impact on the environment. Cattle, cows in particular, tend to not live in the rainforest. They need the rainforest chopped down so that there's grass for them to eat. So less cows, better. They're also contributing significantly to um, methane emissions and climate change. And especially for all of you at this stage in your um, life or your careers, if you pursue a career in environmental conservation, that's got huge benefits um, personally in that it's a, a great career to be in, but also benefits for the planet in that um, you will, if you do your job well, be helping out the planet. All right, and then very important, and you guys have been doing a great job with this, educating the public, spreading the word about the amphibian extinction crisis. Um, tell people about Save the Frogs, tell people about ways they can help, and educate yourself for certain. All right, so that's the end of this segment of the presentation. So um, I'm happy to take some questions right now if there are questions. Oh, excuse me. Hi. Uh, pleasant day to you, sir. I actually do have a question. Okay. Thank you for that very interesting and very informative presentation. Uh, I'm actually a BS biology student here in Bangkok State University. So, okay. Though, so far, I've been exposed to these subjects like uh, the environment and specifically identifying frog species and the like. So uh, my question to you is, what is your stance when it comes to uh, scientific development, urbanization, and other stuff that we need to do whenever we're developing an economy and of course as we're moving forward as a generation of humans now let's see urban planning is an important career so one thing especially if you listen to save the frogs talk you may think that environmental conservation is all uh you know going out and looking for frogs or doing scientific research um or maybe education but um, there's a huge number of things that we can do career-wise for amphibians outside of research, outside of academia. There's environmental law. There's urban planning. So that's what I was thinking about when you were talking. The development is coming, not, hopefully not everywhere. You know, we need some places fully protected. We need some national parks. We need reserves and preserves and wilderness areas but development is coming we all make use of technology we're all on technology right now it's got its it it has its impact the key is that there's some consciousness going into how things are developed and that you know at a minimum if the if the development's going in what can we do to make it as low impact as possible or as low impact as possible given our financial resources. So that does require, it may require environmental lawyers because sometimes, you know, certain politicians and certain companies, they don't care. 
They just want to go in the cheapest and the fastest way and do whatever they want to do. And you may need lawyers. But good urban planning can definitely help out and educate. It, to me, the, the, the basis of all successful environmental conservation is environmental education. If the politicians aren't educated, if the companies aren't educated, if the society isn't educated about the environment, then that's not going to factor into their decisions. But if everybody's environmentally aware and conscious and cares, then I think you can get a lot done to minimize the impact. And maybe even whatever benefits came from that development, maybe some of the proceeds of that could get um, donated or contributed in some respect to environmental um, environmental conservation. So I think there are lots of ways to help out.